Hello and welcome to episode 53 and 54, Trans Transatlantic Security and the Future of NATO. Previously, we have discussed several topics related to NATO and the European security, but uh, hardly we have touched upon the points of transatlantic security. So today, to take a deep dive into this topic, we have with us Matthew Droin. Hi, Matthew. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Matthew, uh, for your time. And I have been reading your publications uh, on this topic. And uh, I'm very much excited to record this uh, episode because this is the first time we are going to discuss a dedicated transatlantic security topics and the related issues as well. Uh, so yeah, before taking a deep dive into the topic, uh, can you tell us briefly about yourself uh, about your background and how did you end up doing what you're doing at the moment as an expert in this domain? Sure. Well, thank you, Amukar, for, for having me on the podcast. So I'm currently a visiting fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, which is a DC-based uh, think tank. Um, I'm a French national and I've been previously working for the, for the French uh, government, namely the uh, the French Ministry for Europe and and Foreign Affairs. Uh, I've been posted mostly in the in the Middle East, uh, previously in uh, in Iraq, in uh, in UAE, in Kuwait, and in the past five years before, uh, prior to joining the CSIS, I, I worked in in Paris first as a desk officer on Syria, uh, and then I I switched to uh, uh, strategic affairs mostly security and defense, political, military uh, issues. And the past two years, I was the deputy head of the uh, uh, strategic affairs uh, department, which deals mostly with uh, European and transatlantic security uh, and defense issues. So mostly dealing with, uh, with NATO and European uh, the European Union uh, security and defense uh, policies. Interesting. So that's a very wide range of career uh, coming from a foreign affairs background to, you know, again, taking a deep dive into the geopolitics and the security of the European domain as well. Uh, so, you know, just to begin with the topic, and as we have a very broad range of audience, you know, because my podcast is also covering uh, space industry issues, uh, primarily military satellites as well. So there are you know some audiences from this segment who uh, primarily won't get uh, the terms or the, uh, I would say in a fine manner, the definition of some of the issues or the topics that we'll be discussing. So to start with on a, on a basic level, can you tell us what is transatlantic security? Right, so transatlantic security is basically security issues that bind together uh, North America and Europe so it's not exactly transatlantic in the sense that it's mostly the northern the northern hemisphere uh, and the idea that these two uh, continents or part of continents are linked uh, by shared uh, at least the sense of shared destinies that is rooted in history of course these countries have fought wars uh, among themselves but they have also fought wars uh, together. Um, and the the sense that they have shared uh, values and, and principles, um, and that is clearly reflected in, in, the, in the NATO uh, treaty or in the NATO preamble, uh, because obviously when we think about transatlantic security, uh, we think about NATO. This is the main embodiment of uh, of this sense of shared challenges and shared uh, destinies in the sense that these are countries that have decided uh, in the aftermath of the second world war facing also a shared enemy that was the or shared a challenge uh, coming from the ussr that they want to put their security together um to avoid fighting wars among themselves but most uh, mostly that is uh, reflected in the, the now famous Article 5 of, of NATO, that an attack against one of them is considered as an attack against uh, all members. And and so to come back to the to the shared values and principle, what the, the NATO preamble states is that it seeks to safeguard the freedom, 
common heritage and civilization of, uh, of their people that are founded in the principles of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. And so these are, until today, although sometimes these principles are challenged in one country or another, um, these are the, let's say, the, the, the bedrock of the, uh, of the transatlantic bond. Interesting. Yeah, we have seen a lot of changes, uh, the evolution of NATO. Of course, the first thing is, I would say, the expansion as well. And I think last year, even France had the presidency of NATO. And we saw, you know, kind of, a, I would say, a little bit changes. And I think there were uh, support to the Ukraine as well. So, you know, with, with that respect, how has NATO's role uh, in ensuring transatlantic security evolved since its inception? And what are its core missions today? Right. So the evolution of NATO is uh, directly tied to the evolution of the uh, what we call the perception of threat um, and the security environment in which it uh, it evolves. And this clearly has been defined mostly by uh, the, uh, the the USSR, uh, which is which was the main reason basically why NATO has been formed with the need to balance the rise of the of the Soviet Union after World War II. Um, and so NATO in its uh, strategic thinking has also evolved uh, according to the different phases of the Cold War. There was the, the nuclear period um, where NATO was also bidding the nuclear deterrence as it's as the core of, uh, of the collective defense. Uh, there have been the phases of detente. Um, and then I would say there were perhaps two periods of uh, what I could call uh, existential crisis for, for NATO. Uh, the first one is the uh, fall of the Soviet Union at the end of the Cold War. Uh, because the main the main threat that justified NATO uh, disappeared, but NATO didn't. Uh, I think it's Margaret Thatcher who said, uh, "You don't cancel your home insurance policy just because there have been fewer burglaries on your street in the last twelve months." And so that that was the idea that NATO uh, is still meaningful. Uh, it just needs to evolve and change its uh, its core missions. Uh, so this is when NATO shifted to crisis uh, crisis management and you could see you could see nato uh, operating in uh, uh, in the balkans or even further away uh, of course afghanistan has been the main uh, the main theater of engagement uh, of nato engagement in the past uh, two decades until its closure um, uh, and and also as you mentioned also the this was the, the period of engagement with uh, newly independent states from uh, from USSR, notably through something called the Partnership for Peace, um, and that prepared the ground for uh, for later extension in the in the two thousands uh, to the to Eastern to Eastern Europe. Uh, so that was the the first part of uh, let's say uh, reshaping and reinventing NATO, and the 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 second. Uh, I would say existential crisis was in the past decade where it was clear that the crisis management was not functioning that well, especially in the, in the Middle East, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, and you also had, uh, for the first time, a U.S. president, namely Donald Trump, who was not so enthusiastic about NATO and actually called it obsolete. Uh, which in turn prompted some European leaders to doubt about the, the utility of NATO without the U.S. being committed. Uh, you might remember uh, President Macron uh, calling it brain dead. And so this has sparked a reflection on what NATO should be in the 21st century. And I wouldn't say uh, fortunately for NATO because this is very unfortunate events, but the, the war in Ukraine triggered by by Russia's invasion has somehow jolted uh, NATO awake because it gave it again a sense of purpose um, and so this is where we where we are now with a clear 
focus to what NATO is is about since since its very inception, which is uh, collective defense and and uh, and protection of its area of, of responsibility through deterrence. Yes, and here as you mentioned about like crisis management and the threats as well, I believe uh, one of the states that is uh, Kosovo, uh, where the NATO troops are deployed, we, we see always you know, a lot of rumble going on uh, in that part of the Baltic region. And, you know, the this question is from that perspective, basically the kind of, you know, threats and challenges we face uh, on that front. So what are the key challenges and threats uh, that NATO faces and the Transatlantic Security Alliance in the 21st century uh, from your perspective? Yes, well, you're right. There are many spots of, of crisis. Kosovo is one of them, but... Uh, to, to get the broader the broader picture um so basically nato uh, works over over some overarching strategic documents that it uh, renews or updates when it think it's necessary uh and they're called strategic concepts and the last one was adopted uh last year in the madrid summit in 2022 so this is the latest strategic concept it happened after uh, the war, uh, the, the the war in Ukraine. So it's it's uh, it's up to date to the strategic environment, and so what what the concept says is that uh, uh, the, the the security environment is now marked by strategic competition, pervasive instability, and recurrent shocks. And by strategic competition, it means it targets mostly uh, Russia, which is uh, defined as. I quote, the most significant and direct threat to ally security and to peace and stability in the Euro-Atlantic area. So clearly Russia is, is the main threat for, for NATO. It has been uh, it has been the case historically and even more so now that it uh, it has waged a war on, uh, uh, on one of NATO's closest partner, namely Ukraine. Um, and what is interesting about the, the latest strategic concept is that for the first time, it clearly mentions China as a challenge. Um, it says that the PRC stated ambitions and coercive policies challenge our interests, securities, and, and security and values. And th this is really uh, something new for, for NATO. The, the previous uh, strategic uh, concept, which was uh, adopted in 2010, didn't even mention uh, China. So this is a, this is a major, major change. Then one of the other um, uh, threats uh, that is clearly identified by NATO, which is not new, is terrorism, which has been one of the main source of, uh, of NATO engagement in the past decades. Terrorism is still considered as, here I quote again, the most direct asymmetric threat to the security of our citizens and to international peace and security. Um, so these are the core uh, topics that are dealt on a daily basis at uh, NATO headquarters. And then you have other uh, emerging threats such as cyber, uh, new technologies, hybrid threats, uh, climate change, uh, is, uh, uh, which I'm sure we'll have the chance to, to deal with later. Yes, definitely. I think uh, hybrid threat is uh, one of uh, the, I would say, emerging and interesting topic and uh, I remember I contributed to some of the research papers back in 2019 and 2020 uh, to the to a Finnish think tank called Hybrid COE, and uh, we were we were providing just you know kind of inputs which were then used by uh, some of the institutes in uh, Estonia because I believe Estonia has an enhanced for forward battlefield uh, EFP it is called in general I think of NATO. So, uh, but we didn't at, at that time, you know, uh, there was a thing that, you know, there have other priorities for NATO to invest in other technologies. Uh, but I hope, you know, uh, in the coming years, we, we will see more investment into countering the hybrid threats, uh, especially, I mean, the recent attack that uh, Hamas carried out on Israel, it was a multi-domain attack, basically. And I think that can be in some way defined as hybrid threat. If some such situation appears, uh, I believe NATO should be capable enough to, you know, uh, defend not only one state, but multiple states at the same time. So I hope, you know, the, there is more, uh, I would say, progress in the hybrid threat because I have personally also 
uh, worked on that topic uh, in the previous years. And yeah, proceeding ahead uh, from your experience and your, I would say, uh, the current research uh, that you do, can you please tell us the role of NATO in the response of Russia's aggression on Ukraine? Sure, it, it's very, very interesting and defining uh, issues because, you know, in, in Russia's narrative, uh, NATO is always uh, front and center as the main source of its, uh, uh, its security uh, issues and uh, NATO's expansion eastwards has been resented uh, really strongly by, uh, by Russia. And the fact that... Uh, Ukraine uh, is willing to uh, to integrate NATO has been an important source of uh, of of, uh, of anger from from Moscow, and in the months leading to the conflict, uh, Moscow has sent letters to both the U.S. and NATO uh, to to state its uh, its conditions for not uh, waging war on Ukraine, and so. In, in the Russian mindset, this has always been conceived as a war against the, the, the West and, and NATO, not only against uh, against Ukraine. Uh, and so the response of NATO uh, in this context uh, is very interesting because uh, NATO really has a crucial and I would say vital role uh, to protect the NATO states against the a Russian aggression, or or only the consequences of a NATO of a, of a Russian aggression, but it doesn't have the the, the ability to uh, to be directly involved in the the military support to to Ukraine. This has been decided very early on. Um, NATO seeks to avoid what is what is called as co belligerence, that is uh, fighting alongside Ukraine because. That would mean finding itself fighting against uh, against uh, Russia, uh, and so that would potentially mean that that Russia attacking a, a NATO member state would trigger uh, Article Five, for instance, or more broadly, that having NATO fighting uh, Russia uh, could lead to um, unmanageable escalation which could even turn into a nuclear escalation. So this is something that NATO members have decided to, to avoid. And so basically NATO does not provide direct military support to, uh, to Ukraine. The military support comes from bilateral decisions uh, or by national decisions of, uh, of uh, NATO members. And is there are some collective frameworks to do it. There is an ad hoc a group called the Rammstein Group, or this is also carried out through the through the European Union, uh, through the so-called European Peace Facility. But again, there is yes. no direct military support from uh, uh, from NATO, and the perspectives of Ukraine joining NATO, uh, which would of course be the main security guarantee for Ukraine, remains until today rather distant because there are still important member states, uh, starting with the U.S. Germany, for instance, that still oppose um, uh, giving a clear timeline, a uh, clear pathway for, for Ukraine on when and how it should join the, the alliance. Interesting. Yep, I think you previously also mentioned, in the, I think, the pre beginning questions that uh, about Article 5. Uh, so with that respect, what is the significance of NATO's Article 5 collective defense clause and how does it shape the alliance's security commitments? Article five is uh, fundamental for for NATO. It's uh, so basically to to remind your your audience, the Article five states that an attack against one ally is considered as an attack against all allies, and so in that sense, Article five is kind of the holy grail. It's the best security guarantee that you can get in the in the world because it ties your security. To the most powerful army in the world, the U.S., uh, and also some of the most powerful armies in the world, to other nuclear powers such as the U.K. or France. Um, I think one interesting example to to show how important Article Five is is to look at uh, Sweden and Finland, 
recent uh, decision to join the alliance, breaking with the years of uh, neutra neutrality. Uh, these two countries were already protected by collective security clauses through the European Union, which also has a security clause, which is called uh, Article 42.7. Uh, but really, they uh, why they wanted to uh, also to 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 apply to uh, to join NATO is also to get the security guarantees that involves the U.S. because ultimately the U.S. remains the most powerful uh, army in, in the world, and and this alone creates a, a very powerful deterrent for any other uh, rival or enemy to uh, to challenge. This, uh, this Article 5. And until now, even in the war in Ukraine, you can see that Russia perhaps, I mean, not perhaps, definitely had some hybrid attacks on on, uh, on Europe, for instance, but really never challenged this Article 5. Interesting. And uh, in what ways does uh, NATO engage with global partners and how does this collaboration enhance transatlantic security, especially considering its uh, growing interest in the Indo-Pacific because, uh, you know, we have seen the movements of, uh, of course, United States, which is one of the prime members in NATO, along with Australia, India, and Japan joining, you know, and creating a, uh, I would say, a group called Quad, under which there is also a defense uh, and security col collaboration. And a uh, lot of, I mean, Chinese experts prefer to call it as Asian NATO. Uh, but also, you know, there is uh, overall the NATO member states are also interested in the Indo-Pacific region. So what are your thoughts on that? Right. I think this is something very important and especially for the for the years to come. Yes. Uh, so uh, especially the current secretary general of NATO, Mr. Stoltenberg, is very keen on NATO having what he calls a global outlook. Uh so there have been several frameworks of cooperation with uh, with partners uh, uh, that are close to NATO, uh, like the, the what we can call Eastern Neighborhood, uh, through the, the Partnership for Peace, or the Southern Mediterranean, through a framework called the Mediterranean uh, Dialogue, which includes seven countries. We also have a framework of the Gulf countries called the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative. And uh, even broader than that, you have something called partners across the globe, which includes country from Colombia to Pakistan, so very diverse range of, uh, of partners. Now, what you mentioned in your question, which I think is very interesting, is the, um, uh, let's say, NATO's growing interest for the, for the Indo-Pacific. And you rightly say that it's mainly driven by the U.S. because, uh, as you are well aware, the, the U.S. now considers China as its main, uh, uh, what is called pacing challenge, which is that really defines most of its foreign foreign policy. And since two thousand sixteen, it has tried to. Um, let's say, raise the awareness of NATO about the, the risks posed by China and in parallel to uh, strengthen partnerships with countries from the region. Uh, and there is one, one uh, preferred framework to do that, which is called the AP4, which stands for Asia Pacific 4, uh, which is a cooperation with four Asia Pacific countries, which are namely uh, Australia, South Korea, Japan, and New Zealand. And this AP4, this cooperation with the AP4 has cons consistently been strengthened. Uh, the their yes. foreign ministers have been invited to uh, NATO meetings. Now even their head of state uh, are attending NATO NATO summits, not all of the summits, but some sessions of, of it. And there are individual tailored partnerships that are uh, that are designed with these uh, these countries. And I I I would conclude on on this that it is not exactly a consensual evolution for for NATO. There are some member states, including the one I'm from France, who are particularly wary of uh, of NATO 
sending the signal that uh, it is evolving towards um, anti-China uh, alliance that would uh, escalate the tensions in the in the in the region. Um, and so, yeah, there there is some skepticism about NATO being too publicly or too overtly uh, changing its attention to the Indo-Pacific, especially at times where there are so many challenges in Europe and and NATO is some sometimes falling short on delivering on its own commitments to reinforce its posture in uh, in Europe. Yes, definitely. I think uh, the power dynamics have changed, basically. Uh, and we see the centralized power is not only with the United States now. Uh, like Asia is uh, primarily, I would say, not Asia itself only, but the Indo-Pacific region. Because, I mean, uh, both the United States and France, they also have the territories over there. And uh, most of the trade, I think, that goes through Australia happens via China. So we see a shift in the power dynamics. So uh, how do this shifting in power, global power dynamics and the rise of new global players uh, like China impact uh, NATO's role in transatlantic security? Mm -hmm. I think it's a fair question, but we, we have to bear in mind that I mentioned NATO, including by its name, is for the, it's for the Atlantic and uh, for its own area of responsibility. And so... Um, NATO might have an outlook for what is happening in the South China Sea or in the Southern Pacific or in Africa, you name it, but it doesn't necessarily have a role there. Um, and so when it comes to NATO's area of responsibility, I think uh, we can say that until today, it remains broadly safe and immune against major conventional uh, threats. Nobody's really... Uh, willing and able to uh, to really challenge uh, NATO in its area of responsibility. Um, although there are there are ways to uh, let's say to uh, to destabilize these uh, the, the NATO countries, especially as we mentioned earlier through hybrid threats. Uh, that is yes. below the threshold of war through disinformation, for instance, which can really affect the social fabrics of uh, of NATO NATO states. So this can have a really destabilizing effect. But perhaps what the global power dynamics change is is for for the the global role of uh, the US taken alone, not through NATO or the the EU, because we can see that the US now is less and less able and willing to play its role of policeman of the world. It cannot act everywhere. It wants yes. to, to pivot to uh, to Asia. And, and it would like, even sometimes it seems impossible, to, uh, to disengage from Europe or from the Middle East. But now with the wars in Ukraine or in the Israel-Gaza war, it's, uh, it's hard for the U.S. to, to really leave these, uh, these regions. Um, and it also raises the question for the EU, can it step step up as a geopolitical actor as it pretends uh, to be, especially as the US pivots away from uh, from Europe. Is EU strong enough to, to tackle Russia alone or to deal with the new threats emerging for, from China? These are the real questions that are for NATO countries, not for NATO itself, but for, uh, for the main NATO uh, members.